get started so that um, I can allow you to enjoy everything we plan about uh, here until uh, you miss the music. Uh, my name is Paul Tarnoff. I'm one of the board members of the Iowa Sustainable Business Alliance. And we are so excited to launch our association, uh, our alliance, this weekend uh, with wonderful guest speakers and the whole fair festival you know, phenomenon. It's a perfect setting for what we're doing. Um, this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, just having Jeffrey Hollander here to inaugurate our, our phenomenal, phenomenal group is such an honor. But what I'd like to do is sort of give you a feeling first as to how all this happened. Because it's, a, it's you know, a really nice story. It's a, it's a great story. And I'd like to preface it a little bit, if you don't mind if I talk for a few minutes, about my own background and something I've perceived over the years and why it will lead to why this is happening and why we're so confident it's going to be a massive success here in Iowa. You know, I, my background, it doesn't matter which, I'm a business consultant, and I help companies grow by aligning them cooperatively with other companies. And I've done it for big companies and small companies. I know many of you know that big company many years ago here, Art Select, that worked with many catalogs and e-commerce companies. You know, we created that. And over the years, it's great. When I was younger, I thought I knew everything. I could have learned it. I knew it all. We all did. Now that I'm 64, I just have a lot of observations. I know very little, but I've learned a few lessons. And one of them is what I call the, 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 the two great motivators. When I introduce companies or people to things, there's two dominant sort of extremes at which people respond. You know, one is what I call the fear extreme. You know, the, you know, I'm set in my ways. I can't change. I don't want anything new. Go away. You know? And the other thing is the opportunity, which is the person who listens and they go, I never thought I would do that. You know, I'm crazy enough to do this. And it's a very interesting thing. It, it, it never ceases to amaze me because I'm always bringing in things that, I don't know, I don't know leading it, but they're new. Nobody was ever thinking of doing them. So whenever you do that, the vast majority, it's more over than 99%, are afraid. And then you have this small group that wants to do it. And it's so funny that the, these two extremes are also motivators that end up making things happen. You know, the person who does something out of opportunity is the crazy one who just does it and says, we'll just jump into this and figure it out. That's their motivation. But what happens to the other group is, once that crazy person does something, they're afraid of not keeping up with them. And then they fall. And I, I'm sure you're all familiar with that phenomenon. And it's so funny, I can walk in the room, see the body language, see everything that's going on, and immediately know whether parties are going to do it or not do it. And I can tell, actually, when people are fearful, when they're going to do it. And I've watched this over the years. And that's what's happening here right now. We are in an amazing transition. And it all started, this ISBA thing, the, you know, it's, it, it all started because about a little over a year ago, I received an email from Jeff Hollander inviting me to come to the White House. You know, Jeffrey founded an organization called the American Sustainable Business Council, which at the time had 150,000 businesses. And Obama and his team invited Jeffrey and his group to come to the White House for an all-day celebration. It was, you know, it started. Eight or nine in the morning, went to lunch for dinner. It was, it was amazing. And there were 30, about 30 White House senior people there, nine, seven or nine cabinet members, you know, top policy people. And we covered everything agriculture, energy, people, health, you know, everything. And what amazed me by it, because I, I said this last night at our reception, you know, I arrived there very skeptical of what was going on in Washington, just sort of. Ambivalences. I wasn't really angry, I just didn't care. Because I didn't think anything would really happen. And it was amazing, <coughs> this phenomenon. It was all about success. It was all about things that were happening. 
it, we didn't even talk about politics very much. It was the, the, the people at the White House told us all the things they were doing without attack by using existing legislation and regulations and making things happen. And uh, along with me came my daughter Laura, who organized this event, and, and Troy Van Beek, many of you know here, uh, you know, from Ideal Energy. And we were blown away by it. And the thing that blew us away more than anything, or me, I can really speak for myself, was the fact that, that you know, the 125 people that came from ASBC were welcomed by the White House staff with open arms saying, we need you. We need people who have the ideas. We are ready to implement them for you, but we need you to help us. And what was even more than that, that and I, it was the fact that they kept saying that 150,000 businesses being part of this organization within three years, two or three years, it had grown, was a force to be reckoned with. You know, and I, again, I said this last night, one of the cabinet members said, um, said to us that she had been up on Capitol Hill talking to an extremely conservative senator. And he mentioned to her, you know, you got to find out about this group, ASBC. They have 150,000 people now. We need to listen to them. And that's what made me aware that the opportunity, Jeffrey was that person who saw the opportunity and created that organization. You know, he, he's a person who did that. And along with the others, but, you know, it was his vision that it took, imagine two or three years having 150,000 members. Now they have 200,000. <coughs> Imagine what it took to get there, and now the other people are following. So we decided to set this up here in Iowa, the Iowa, Iowa Sustainable Business Alliance, to, as you're, you're going to hear much more about it throughout the morning, but we decided to set it up to one mirror what the national group was doing, to really bring in advocacy, policy, education, and help small, mid-sized companies, students, healthcare company, everybody have a voice in Des Moines. Because yeah, yeah, there's so many people doing good things, as you're going to hear in some of our panelists. You know, we want them to keep doing what they're doing, and we're going to be their voice to help them provide education. But we're going to do more. We're going to be easy. We're going to have, you know, have courses to help business learn to be more sustainable. We're going to have intern programs. We're doing all these things. And what we're finding is, no matter who we talk to about this, I mean, Richard at Oak Creek's Cleaners, when I came back from Washington, I told him all about it. He says, I want to join. You know, it's like everybody we talk to is inspired for some reason. The time has come, or the planets are alive. Nothing could be better than walking into a situation that's ready to happen. It's, you know, it's like it's, it's effortless. So that's what we're here to do today, is celebrate that. And uh, you're going to hear a lot about it. We invite all of you to become members and join with us and let us help you. But first, we're going to start you know, by letting you know what it's all about by introducing Jeffrey. Um, you know, Jeff Hollander, I met him, gosh, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago at, at a conference where I was speaking. And then he came up to me and asked me a question. And I became a consultant to Seventh Generation. And we just became <coughs> friends and associates. I don't know. It's, it's been fun. It's been a lot of fun, and you know, you know, there's the traditional introduction. You know, Jeffrey's a leading authority on corporate responsibility, sustainability, social equity. You know, he started Seventh Generation, which I think you all know. Uh, you know, and he built that company up from you know a startup to the leading company in its category. He's you know the co-chair of Greenpeace USA. He's you know he started the, the American Sustainable Business Council. He's on many boards of nonprofits, companies, all of that. And, you know, you can go to his website and look all that stuff up. I don't really need to tell you all that. It's all sort of fillers, you know. It's easy to learn about Jeffrey. But the thing that amazes me about Jeffrey is that idea of somebody who sees an opportunity. You know, I went to architecture school and studied with Bucky Fuller. And I've been sort of a, you know, advocate of radical short hair radical over the years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I enjoyed it. But when I met Jeffrey, it was amazing. You know, nowadays, we all throw these words around, like sustainability, transparency, you know, uh, triple bottom line companies. All of these things which are part of our language now that inspire us, that we tell our friends about that we're doing these things. You know, all of that has become commonplace. When I first met Jeffrey, nobody would even listen to him. I mean, you know, that, that was like, it was a different time. And I know when he wrote one of his books a few years ago, 
He mentioned he went back to major corporations and he found out they were adopting many of these things. And nowadays, you know, it's, it's normal. We now have the people, I mean, not, not that you are all fearful, but you've opened your awareness, and most of you are opportunity type people, but people who've been afraid of these things are now open to you. And he is one of the leaders that did this, along with the Social Venture Network and, you know, Ben Cohn and Bob Stiller from Green Mountain Coffee, all these people who are in Burlington, Vermont, the home of socialism. You know, they did all this. And it's really wonderful. And I, I just have to tell you, things I've learned, the, the most important things I've learned from Jeffrey, and I'm going to tell you one story of what happened and then let him talk, is that uh, I would go to Burlington, Vermont when I was consulting, and I didn't know anything. You know, like the Sky Factory here that has you know, this wonderful management system that involves everyone. I mean, they were doing this back then. And I walked into this company, and I'm watching Jeffrey not just pay attention to the profitability of his company, because I'm a consultant, but pounding into me. We have to make sure that every person we relate to, whether it's our employees, you know, the UPS person, our customers, our stockholders, whatever. I mean, the word stakeholder that I don't even think existed, or if it did, it was hardly mentioned, but he read that into me. You know, and then I watched them. I mean, I, as the years, I would go back there and watch the employees there who love working there. How many companies do you walk into where everyone loves working there? And they're growing. You know, Jeffrey would say, I'm putting people in a position where they can succeed. Things like that. You know, the sharing of the wealth of the company. You know, letting everybody be owners. You know, the limiting of executive salaries to only 17 or 18 times the lowest salary in the company. While watching other CEOs, you know, just take the money. All of this happened, but there was one time, many things that happened, but there was one that really got me. And this was, I don't even remember the specifics. We were sitting there, and Seventh Generation is really proud of the brand. You know, they make a promise to us, the consumers, that you're getting the best we can do. And they say what that is, knowing that there's a lot more they can do. As Jeffrey says, it's not so much all that we did. He says he knows the things they've not been able to do. You know, it's, it's an amazing attitude, but I'll never forget that uh, Jeffrey wasn't even the top sales guy there. Uh, I forget his name. Uh, anyways, we're sitting in a room, and all of a sudden they became aware that one of their products was being sold nationwide was not what they said it was completely. Not that it was horribly bad, but something was wrong with the product. I don't remember the specific thing. So, you know, here's all the salespeople who fought like crazy to get the products on the shelves and were fighting to keep them there. Jeffrey said, we have to take it all off the shelf. We have to take the products back because we made a promise to our customers that we should keep it. And they took the products off the shelf. And I'm just sitting there, oh my gosh. You know, I sort of imagine this, walk into high B. And imagine what it would be like if all the companies had their products on the shelf. You know, got to remove them if they weren't telling the truth, if we're told all the time. <laughs> so it would be empty. But here was a company that made one little mistake, and they did this. And that tells you who Jeffrey is. I mean, that, that's who Jeffrey is. So what I'd like to do now is invite Ed Malloy to come up and just uh, welcome Jeffrey to Fairfield, and then Jeffrey will give his responsibility revolution talk. Oh, and after that, it's going to be complete audience participation. And then we have three panelists to give some examples of things happening in Iowa, and then discussions with them, so it should be a lot of fun. This is how we did happen at the White House, we just copied that, that format. So, um, Ed? Thank you, Paul, and congratulations to the launch of your Iowa Sustainable Business Association. It really marks uh, another milestone for our community in our leadership role that we play as a small community in defining how, from a grassroots level, we can have a significant impact in this transformation that our society needs to go through. And we do it in a way that is always celebratory, which is wonderful. Uh, this weekend was defined to be a celebration of music and the launch of this great association and of the, and the principles of sustainable business practices. You know, it's interesting, I reflect back to 2006 when we received the, one of the designations as one of Iowa's great places. 
And in our presentation to the state at that time, we basically said that we would model economic diversification, uh, the development of culture and the arts, and also be a leader in sustainability. And we received grant funding for each of those. And with some of our funds, we built the first sustainable living center out at the out of, uh, Eco Village. Uh, since that time, the city undertook a process, a year-long process, to create a 10-year Go Green sustainable uh, sustainability plan for the city. And so many things have been accomplished during that time that I think you're going to hear about. Most recently, uh, Fairfield had a, a, was recognized as an environmental leader by the uh, governor of Iowa and also accomplished one of our goals of reducing our energy consumption as a community. We had set a target over about an 18 month period of four and a half percent and we accomplished eight uh, percent reduction. programs that many companies and, uh, and individual homes participated in, but again, just from that grassroots level, just from the spirit of moving in the direction of what is right, what is more in accord with natural law, and our community is so good at that, that celebrating that milestone today with the launch of this business association, again, conceived by uh, Paul and his associates here in Fairfield, and as he reaches out to Iowa to enlist 25,000 other uh, business, small businesses in Iowa, he is going to have behind him the credibility of what this community represents in that area. So people will know that this is something that uh, this is a train worth getting on, a bandwagon worth, worth following. So we congratulate you on that. Last night, I uh, had the opportunity to be at a reception with Jeffrey Hollander where he gave a, just a short impromptu talk about uh, his, the principles that have guided his life and where he is right now, both personally and from a business standpoint. And I have to tell you, um, the room was very, very inspired by this man. There's no question about it. We have attracted someone who is a thought leader in this uh, area, and we are thrilled to have him in this community to help us celebrate this milestone and really be a part of this great launch and hopefully the beginning of a true partnership with him because hopefully that he is recognizing and identifying uh, a community that really does have the passion and the power to carry through and to follow through with uh, these types of initiatives to have a significant impact and you know, America is really made up of thousands of small cities like Fairfield, and what better way to get that message across than to have our community demonstrate that. So please join me in giving a, a warm Fairfield welcome to Mr. Jeffrey Hahn. Secondly, you know, yes, I have a talk to give, but, but I'm here for you. And in order for you to get the most out of what I have to say, please try to make this a dialogue if you have a question. I mean, we will do a formal question and answer session at the end, but, but if you can't believe something I'm saying, or if you uh, have a question, please feel free to raise your hand and, and engage in this dialogue, because I'm, I'm really here. I hope what I have to say will be of value, but you can make sure it is by, by being a participant and asking questions. So, uh, I want to start by talking a little bit about seventh generation. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about seventh generation and some of the lessons I've learned. I'm going to talk about 
the larger landscape of what's happening in this country and, and where we have challenges which, which will be uh, uh, sometimes difficult to hear, but then also talk about opportunities and, and talk about some of the most exciting things that, that, uh, that I'm seeing that are truly inspirational. And as, as Paul said, being the kind of company that, that Seventh Generation was, we were always focused as much on our successes as our failures. And I, I often think about relationships, and I often think about, you know, brands like to tell you how good they are, how, how all of the great attributes, and companies like to do the same thing. And I think about who would like to be in a relationship with someone who all they talked about was how great they were. But, but that is the paradigm in which business generally operates, right? They don't stand up and say, here's all the places I'm screwing up, here's all of our shortcomings. All they do is talk about how great they are, and, and, and that paradigm, I think, is slowly coming to an end. Because you can't build... You can't build deep, authentic, loyal relationships based on a perception that really is false. So, so seventh generation uh, has accomplished some good things, and, and, and I like to talk about the good things. We, we really did create a very authentic, uh, authentic brand that people trusted. <clears throat> we worked hard, though didn't always succeed, to create a culture that was the best place that anybody had ever worked. I mean, our goal was to create an experience for all our employees where they would absolutely tell their friends, I work at the best place I've ever worked in my life. And that was always as much a priority as sales and profits were. We did work hard to create safer, more responsible, and sustainable products. We historically donated 10% of our profits to nonprofit organizations. Each year, and this is critically important, I was uh, uh, in a meeting the other day, <clears throat> and there is this new sharing economy that's arising, which is, which is a wonderful thing. So one of the leading companies in this sharing economy is called Airb2b, where you can sleep on someone's couch. And, you know, so, we, so this is all about sharing. And then what I hear is that the three people that started the company own 100% of the stock and none of the employees own any of them. And I thought, what a huge disconnect. And one of the challenges that we face is that companies seize on one or two good things, but don't approach their business from a holistic, systemic fashion and bring those values into everything they do. So they're waving their left hand, talking about all the good stuff they do, but their right hand, is continuing to do a lot of the stuff that business has historically done. And one of the opportunities for your organization is to help businesses approach what they do in that holistic fashion, because we're not going to solve the challenges we face by picking one or two good things to focus on. Paul talked about pay equity. I mean, we live in a world where the CEOs of large companies make 500 times what the lowest paid person makes. That's ridiculous. No one is worth that much money, no matter who they are. And we created, you know, I think what was important is that, yes, we did lots of crazy things. You know, we, we did, you know, there was always a massage therapist there to give people massages and dogs running around the office and we paid $5,000 to help people buy uh, hybrid cars, and we paid $1,000 to help them buy energy efficient uh, equipment for their home. So we, we did all this good stuff, and we were spending all this money, but at the same time, we created a very successful business that over the past decade grew about 30% a year, and over the last decade, increased shareholder value by over 1,000%. So, Sometimes it helps in this world to do well with your financial metrics because then all of a sudden people sort of think, wow, maybe these people do know what they're doing. 
maybe they're not totally crazy because they're generating better financial results than us, most other businesses. But now I want to talk about some of the challenges and some of our, our failures. Um, at the end of the day, seventh generation was an exception to the rules, but didn't change the rules. So while we had happy employees and while we created better products, the world as a whole, uh, depending on your perspective, uh, was either not getting better or continuing to get worse. Seventh generation is fundamentally not a sustainable business. We believe in sustainability, we aspire to sustainability, but we were not sustainable. We created products that essentially were less bad than traditional products. And it's really important to not confuse less bad and good. think about a good product. Most of what they think about is a less bad product. So there's no question that if you're going to buy a paper towel, it's better that it's made from recycled fiber, that it's not bleached. But we're not going to save the world by buying better paper towels or better baby diapers. And what seventh generation did was make bad products a little less bad. But what we need today are businesses that are making truly good products, products that are regenerative, products that when you add up all of their impacts, not just in their supply chain and their manufacturing, but in the consumer use and disposal, actually are net positive rather than less negative. And that is one of the biggest shortcomings that seventh generation had. Another one, is that, is that in part because of the economic system that we live in, responsible products, organic products, often cost more money. Now, that is often not the fault of the companies that are making these good products. Good products cost more money because they take responsibility and internalize and take responsibility for costs that other businesses externalize. So, you know, you, you go out and you buy an organic strawberry and it costs more money than a non-organic strawberry. Why does the non-organic strawberry cost more money? Because society pays all of the costs related to the pollution of our groundwater with pesticides, increased health care when workers are exposed to those pesticides, soil erosion, lots of other things. So when you don't dump those costs onto society and you internalize them, in your products and in your business, you often end up with higher costs. And what happens is that those people who most need those safe, healthy products, people that are making less money, of lower income, can't afford all the good stuff that all these wonderful companies create. And that is, is, is somewhat of a tragedy. I mean, I, I often say that seventh generation sold healthier products to healthier, wealthier people. And that's good for them, but it was not solving the fundamental problem that we need to address in our society. So, I can't help myself but talk for two minutes about the new business I'm starting because the new business is really an attempt to get right all of the things that I didn't get right at seventh generation. Now, I know that I will not succeed in doing that. I will continue to fail, I just hope I will fail a little bit less than I did last time around. And what I wanted to do with this new business, first of all, I wanted to have a product that did not cost more money, so that everybody could buy. It. So a healthier, better product that could, act, that could be accessed to everyone. I wanted a product that was going to be truly good rather than less bad, so that the more people that used it and the more widely it was distributed, the world would actually be a better place as a result of that. And I also wanted to basically show a system approach to problems and show how they're all interconnected, show how the AIDS crisis is connected to the hunger crisis, how inequality is connected to climate change. 
And I wanted to have a product that connected all those dots. And so I am launching at the end of the year a new brand called Sustain. And Sustain will be the first non-toxic, fair trade, sustainable, and I could go on and on, GMO-free, vegan approved, you name it, we got it. <laughs> brand of commons. <laughs> personal note, after spending 25 years selling tampons and toilet paper, so far condoms have been a lot more fun. And at, this, at this point in my, in my life, that's, that's quite important. Um, so, um, let me shift for a moment to a uh, less happy subject, and I want to just take a moment to paint a picture of the challenge that we are up to before I talk about some solutions. And, and uh, these challenges can be uh, uh, sobering, to say the least. But, but today we have a, a, a business community that is generally not one of the most trusted, in fact, is one of the least trusted institutions in our society. Um, we, we have... Uh, what I think is, is sort of mind-boggling greed. We have individual hedge fund managers making $4 billion a year. One person, one person making $4 billion a year and paying less taxes than his assistant. He, because there is not a female hedge fund manager yet making that much money, and I guess that, if I was to bet, that probably won't happen because I don't think women are quite as greedy as men. But um, um, we also have, we have what I think is, is, is one of the, the saddest things about business, which is business is focused on doing what is legal rather than what is ethical or moral. We have totally lost touch with the sense that business should do the right thing. What business says is, we're here to maximize profits for our shareholders, and we will do anything we can do as long as it's not illegal. Well, the truth is, they do a whole bunch of illegal stuff too, but they don't talk about that until they're caught. Um, but, so, so what you have, and, and, and you know, look, I go and I buy Starbucks coffee, and I don't want to pick on Starbucks, but we have companies like Starbucks, like Apple, like General Electric, that don't pay taxes. There were demonstrations in England uh, about three months ago because Starbucks had been in the UK for 10 years with hundreds of stores and never paid a single dime in taxes. And people said, how is, how is that possible? Sorry? Did I miss a comment there? Oh, they don't have dimes in England, they have pennies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So they never paid a shilling or <laughs> a pound in taxes. Uh, now, Starbucks is, is not a, a, a stupid company. Would they stay in England for 10 years and open up more and more stores if they weren't making money? Of course not. But what they do is they give the ownership to their brand name to a company in Belgium where the taxes are very low. The stores in the UK pay a huge fee to the company in Belgium. So much money that they actually don't make a profit or don't show a profit in the UK. And they pay their taxes in Belgium or Ireland or some other country where the taxes are incredibly low. To me, now, is that legal? Yeah, it's legal. But, but, but how can you run a business where you have employees using public education, public transportation, using the fire department, the police department, and not contribute to the services that the society is providing you? Now, we have that in the United States. We have the state of California that caught Walmart and calculated that it costs the state of California two to $500 million a year 
to take care of Walmart employees who don't have health care insurance in the emergency rooms of their hospitals. So the state of California is providing health care insurance for Walmart employees instead of Walmart. And I think that, that, that one of the reasons why we need organizations like ASBC and like this new organization in Iowa is we do have to change the rules of the game. We need to change the rules so that companies are forced to behave in a more moral, ethical fashion. Because left to their own, we've sort of learned that, that not all of them do that. And today, despite what you hear about the economy, the profits at corporations are the highest they have ever been since profits at corporations were measured. Tax payments from corporations are at the lowest level they've ever been. Taxes on executive pay have been cut in half since 1970. 1% of America owns 50% of the wealth. So, and, and these statistics go, go on and on and on. You know, there are one out of every six people in America that are on food stamps. We have two million children in America that are homeless. Two million children that are living in cars, that are living under uh, bridges. And, and you think, is that the sign of a, of, a, of a compassionate, advanced society? That we're willing to leave so many of the people in our society behind as some of us succeed. And again,
So I want to talk now just a little bit more uh, about uh, the responsibility revolution. And I want to talk first about, uh, you know, why should a company be more responsible, be more ethical? Why should a company do the right thing instead of what is legal? Why should a company be compassionate? And there is an abundance of information and statistics available today that the companies that are the most responsible attract and retain the best talent. You know, it, it's not all about reducing CO2 emissions and using less water and losing less energy. In a very fundamental way, if you want to have a business that attracts and keeps the best people, you need to be a business that acts in a responsibly way. And the same is true for consumer loyalty and trust. We built our business at Seventh Generation pretty much without advertising. We built it because we told the truth, we fulfilled our commitments, we were authentic, and we built an incredible following of consumers, many of whom I know are in the room today. 75% of the value of the average American company is in something that we call intangibles, mostly represented by brand value. 75% of the average business, it's no longer plant and equipment and real estate. It's mostly those intangibles like brand value. And I, you know, I do a fair amount of consulting for large companies and I say to them, you spend, you know, you would get fired from your job if you did not have insurance to cover all your tangible assets. No business would think about not having insurance for their building, not having insurance for their industry, but they leave their largest asset, their reputation, unprotected by not behaving in a responsible, ethical fashion. And I say, at a minimum, you should be spending as much money on protecting your brand as you're protecting your tangible assets. And one of the challenges that we have is that often we're not good at making the business case for doing these things. It, it's nice to say this is the right thing to do. It's better to be able to also say, and that better thing to do will be twice as valuable and twice as profitable as continuing to behave in the way you've been behaving. And this flows down through better supply chains. <clears throat> it, it creates more predictable and consistent profits. And in many cases, it creates a license for you to operate. I mean, Walmart has never opened a store in Manhattan and has been kept out of Manhattan because the people of Manhattan don't want it. They have a reputation for putting little companies out of business. They have a reputation for paying low wages. <clears throat> and some communities have successfully kept companies out because they don't think they'll be good community citizens. And if you have a responsible company, everybody wants you. They want you on in their town. They want you in their community. And just to take a look at, at some of I mean, I have a list of probably a thousand studies that have been done, but, but just to give you an example, um, to me, one of the best metrics of responsible business is the list that Fortune magazine does <clears throat> of the 100 best companies to work for. I think those people that are inside a company know better than anyone else whether that company is good or bad, whether they're responsible or irresponsible, and they put this list together by interviewing and having thousands of employees fill out the information. So if you had invested in the 100 best companies to work for in 1998 when the list first came out, and you had kept your money in those companies, the ones that are public, you would have made twice as much money as the S&P 500 index. The Society for Human Resources says that companies with stronger sustainability programs have 55% better morale, they're 43% more efficient, they have a 43% better public image, and they have 38% better loyalty. One of the most important statistics, and 
one of the ones that is unfortunately uh, a place that we're not making much progress. Credit Suisse looked at the performance of 2,400 businesses worldwide since 2005. Now we know that one of the places where women have not made much progress is on the corporate boards of public companies. A little bit more so in management, but not so in corporate boards. Well, they found that if there was one woman on the board, that company's financial performance was on average 26% better than companies that didn't crazy research group. This is Credit Suisse. And, and I'm thinking, gee, if I'm running a company with no women on the board and Credit Suisse did this research and said, by having a woman on the board, I'm more likely to do better financially, I can look for a woman to put on the board. No. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Except in Europe. I don't know if you know this. Uh, in Norway, in order to remain a public company, you have to have your board comprised of 40% women, or you lose the right to be a public company. Yes. So now I, how am I doing on time? Oh, what? Right. I'm okay. okay. Um, so, now I want to shift and talk specifically about some examples of positive things that are happening around the globe when it comes to responsible, sustainable business. The, the first thing I want to talk about is a project that I have spent the past couple of years working on called the Bronx Community Development Initiative. And the Bronx Community Development Initiative is trying to, to tackle some very tough problems. The Bronx is still an incredibly poor place, uh, incredibly escalated rates of unemployment, poverty, asthma, obesity, you know, you name it, and if it's bad, the Bronx has more of it than anywhere else. Um, and so, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, with a, a group of people from MIT, we went over and visited the, the Mondragon cooperatives in uh, Spain. How many people are familiar with Mondragon? So not, a lot of people that don't, don't know Mondragon. So, so Mondragon is roughly 50 years old. Uh, they have created 125 companies. Uh, all of the businesses are worker cooperatives, which means that all of the businesses are 100% owned by their employees. The salary ratio is one to four. So. This is a $30 billion conglomerate that is run by a guy who makes four times what the lowest paid person makes. They have 13 educational institutions that train the people that work there, and they do that because one of their primary goals is to keep people employed. When they run into trouble, when a business runs into trouble, and, and doesn't grow or contracts, they'll move the staff from one company to another company rather than letting people go. And it is one of the most inspiring models of business that I've seen anywhere in the world. There is a similar group in Italy called Lega Co-op and uh, a similar group in England called uh, the Cooperative Group. So these are these are successful. These are these are you know they have their own banks, they have their own insurance companies. And they are creating a more just and equitable society with the businesses that they have started. So being inspired by that example, we said, well, we're going to go set up a whole bunch of worker cooperatives in the Bronx, except, you know, we were challenged by uh, uh, what they were going to make and, and, and who they were going to sell it to. So we, we borrowed uh, uh, from this model in, in Cleveland, Ohio, called the Evergreen Project. How many people have ever heard of the Evergreen Project? I mean, if you haven't heard of it, it's worth checking it out. Because what the Evergreen Project did, faced with some of these same challenges, is they said, 
we're going to go talk to the local institutions in, in, in our community. And we're going to say, we want you to commit a certain percentage of your purchasing to new cooperative businesses that are employing very low-income people. And that will create a, a, a fundamentally better community environment for you to operate in. And it will be less of a drain on the social services that we have. It will be a way of building wealth for a community that has, has, has faced some of the toughest challenges that we have. So we got 13 institutions in the Bronx who purchased collectively $6 billion to basically make a commitment that they would divert some of their purchasing to help get these businesses going. Now that's a model that can be used anywhere. Any, every community has institutions. And every community can use those institutions to stimulate its own economy by buying locally. And by buying locally, particularly from cooperative or at least partially employee-owned sustainable businesses. And to me, this is a very exciting development because it can happen anywhere in the world. And one of the great things is that, that, that you know, these institutions buy huge amounts of stuff. Huge amounts of stuff. And their focus has historically been on, you know, let's buy the, the most stuff, the cheapest we can. And they don't really think about it from a systemic and a holistic uh, uh, perspective because it's very expensive for a community to have people who, who, who can't provide for themselves and the community has to come up with those funds to provide for them. And it is much better to get all those people employed. So that's a very exciting example. Uh, an exciting example in a totally different field from a very, very large company uh, is, is what Unilever has undertaken in, in the past three years. And, Unilever has made a commitment to cut their social and environmental footprint on the planet in half over the next six or seven years while they double their growth. And they have committed to help a billion people who were living in deep poverty out of that. And one of the things that they've done that is the most impressive to me is they've redefined what they are responsible for. Most companies, when they talk about their environmental footprint, they talk about the energy used to make the products and transport the products and the packaging. And what Unilever has said is that if we design a shampoo that causes you to spend 15 minutes in the shower shampooing your hair, and you use a lot of hot water to do that, and that causes CO2 emissions, that's our responsibility. Because we've designed a product that, that the consumer can only use by having a harmful effect on the environment. Now, to me, that's an entirely positive paradigm shift. And all companies need to reframe the way they think about their responsibility to include the way the consumer uses it, disposes of it, the entire system that that product or service touches upon. And what's been interesting is that that commitment by Unilever has inspired other companies like Kimberly Clark to make similar commitments. And Unilever has, has basically caused businesses to say, look, well, if Unilever can do that, we can do that too. And Unilever, by the way, would have been a great investment uh, over the past three to five years because they've also shown that this type of commitment is good for business. <clears throat> Another interesting company, uh, uh, which is sort of the, the European equivalent to uh, Home Depot, is a company called Kingfisher. And they have made this net positive commitment. Their commitment is to help their customers generate more energy than they use. Their commitment is to be a net positive company. So when you add up all of their impacts, if they're going to cut lumber down, cut trees down to sell lumber, they have to plant more trees than they cut down. And they've taken this system's approach. And they have committed to have 
more of a positive impact on the planet than they have a negative impact. So, <clears throat> there are good things happening, and there are good things happening with some very large companies, which I, I certainly didn't think would be the case uh, uh, even five years ago. So I want to sort of end <clears throat> by talking about uh, some of the principles that I think responsible businesses need to commit to. And it is important that we think about this from the point of view of principles. It, it's not just about saying we're committed to energy conservation. It's important that we have principles that drive the way we shape our priorities and shape the commitments we make. <coughs> so as, as I mentioned, uh, to me, the most important commitment is to approach things from a holistic and, and systemic fashion. And I just want to talk a little bit about why that's important. Um, you know, you, you live in, in uh, the land that, that probably has, has a, a lot to do with the ethanol industry. And when we started thinking about ethanol, people thought, well, geez, if we can make fuel from vegetables, isn't that better than using petroleum? And as time unfolded, we saw lots of negative, unintended consequences that came along with the ethanol industry. Uh, and as I'm sure you know, we, you know last year, 40% of all the corn grown in the United States was used to make ethanol. Now, that would only be possible with the huge government subsidies that are now being phased out. But with the shift of using so much corn for ethanol, corn prices went up. And what happened? People in Mexico, people around the world, ended up not being able to afford one of the primary food staples that they rely on. So unintentionally, we caused hunger and we caused people to starve to death because we drove the price of this commodity up, mostly with government subsidies that allowed that to happen. And if you listen to some scientists, they'll tell you that to create ethanol takes a, about as much energy as is produced with the ethanol. So, you know, the idea of making fuel from vegetables is sort of, is, is corn a vegetable? At one point in time, when corn was a vegetable, uh, <laughs> Not yet a mineral, but somewhere <laughs> between a vegetable and a mineral. But um, so we, yes. Please, thank you for giving me a break. I recently visited an ethanol production plant with my students, and they say we're using coal that's not used for food, rather for feed, so there's no any problem. That's what they say. But it's the land use. Yeah, that's not what the children in Mexico say. I mean, I don't know. Feed and food is different. Well, we, we have a limited amount of land. Yeah. And we choose what to grow on that land. So, uh, you know, I mean, maybe they've chosen to grow corn that is not used for food. But that wasn't the case 10 years ago. 10 years ago, when ethanol wasn't consuming 40% of the corn crop, that you know, that corn was probably not being used. Now, maybe it was used for animal feed, which is another problem. You know, growing corn to create beef is hugely inefficient. One of the most inefficient things that we could possibly do with corn because it takes so much corn to create the same amount of protein and nutrition. So that wouldn't necessarily be a much better solution. And as the world population grows, and everyone wants to eat meat like the way Americans eat meat, we won't be able to feed enough people. We, we could feed everybody on the planet if we weren't using our, our valuable cropland in a way that was inefficient to create nutrition and protein. And we weren't encouraging people to spend their money on food that is the least nutritious and the most harmful to their, their health. But, Another example, is, another example is, 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 is palm oil. So, you know, 
seventh generation was very focused on making cleaning products from vegetables rather than petroleum. And so we got, we switched and made all of our formulas uh, with palm oil. And we thought we were doing the right thing. And then when you look into the palm oil industry, you see that the palm oil industry, even though it's a, a natural vegetable, is, is, is hugely disastrous environmentally. Huge amount of climate change comes because in Malaysia and Indonesia, <clears throat> they're burning down the rainforest and planting palm oil crops. And we, we came very close to deciding that we would actually be better off using petroleum than we would be using palm oil. Now, we ended up using sustainably harvested palm oil instead of abandoning palm oil. But all of this is just to say, we, the, the process of making these decisions for businesses, as well as for us as individuals, is a complex one. And we have to understand the system in which that decision takes place. And we have to understand all of the externalities and unintended consequences. And unfortunately, this is not the way most people are taught to think. One of the things that, that would be wonderful is if every child, when they entered school, was taught systems thinking. So they could actually think about, well, if I do this, here's all of the ramifications that will flow from my actions, all of the implications and unintended consequences. So businesses, in the seventh generation, we taught every employee systems thinking. It was, it was part of their fundamental education. So I'm, I, I'm a little worried about going too slow here. So, um, <clears throat> and I, here's something that I know that you, you, you can all relate to. Uh, but, but if I was not in Fairfield, it would be uh, uh, seen as a more, more strange and, and outlandish thing. Uh, <clears throat> You know, companies have a director of corporate responsibility. That's increasingly commonplace. Well, seventh generation had a director of corporate consciousness. And, and we, we, believe, we believe that without greater consciousness, you couldn't be responsible. And so he had the most important job, which was to figure out how to consistently build consciousness within our company and within the individuals that are working at the company. And that changed the context and the framework within which we thought about being responsible. And I've talked, about, talked a bit about ownership. I think ownership is critical. Personally, I don't think a business that doesn't share ownership with its employees can be responsible or be sustainable or be ethical. I think that, that employee ownership is <laughs> I've talked about radical transparency. You know, when we think about transparency, it's not about what we want to tell you. It's trying to anticipate anything that you want to know about us. And if you would be interested in something, if you would want to know it, it is our responsibility to share it with you. <clears throat> Another challenge, and I, and, I, and I must say this is one of the toughest ones, is that we try to grow too quickly. And rapid growth is not sustainable. One of the challenges we had is because we were growing so quickly, we didn't invest enough in the development and training of our own employees. We were always out trying to hire people who we thought had the experience at a bigger company that we needed to get to where we wanted to go. That was a great disservice to our employees, but it was also highly destructive to the culture of the company because those individuals may have known things that we needed to know. Mostly, they didn't know as much as we thought they knew, and they also had a lot of bad habits that they, they, they brought into the business. But this question of what level and rate of growth is sustainable is really a difficult question, because you, know, you go to, I'm, I'm just finishing raising the money for this new condom company, 
And I was meeting with a, a, a venture capital guy, and he was saying, you know, I love your business. You're an incredibly talented guy. You have a great track record. But I just don't see how I can make 10 times my money in three years. And I said, well, I don't see how you can either. You're not supposed to. Uh, but, but, but there is, there is, now part of that is because a lot of these venture capital investors make nine bad investments and they got to get all that money back out of the one that works so that they, you know, it's like they, they got to get every drop of blood out of the stones they can possibly get. But, but we have a, a totally unbelievable, realistic sense of what is sustainable and what should be achievable. I mean, one of the, uh, to digress for a second, one of the, the, the most amazing books that I've read is a book called The Spirit Level. People have read that. And The Spirit Level talks about, um, you know, happiness and well-being and the indicators of happiness and well-being. And they come to the conclusion, right or wrong, that more equal societies do better in almost every metric of happiness and well-being. And this notion that I want to make 10 times the money that I invest in three years is the kind of thinking that separates our society, concentrates the wealth in the hands of fewer and fewer people, and is really destructive to our social fabric. And I mean, I, I must say, I, when I look out into the future, uh, you know, I'm, I'm co-chair of Greenpeace, so of course I'm concerned about climate change, but I'm equally concerned about the social fabric of this country. I'm equally concerned that we watch demonstrations in, in, in other parts of the world, and I don't think we're as far away from that potential disruption in this country, because there are so many people who are living lives that are so different that at some point, at some point, they're going to say they've had enough.
Yeah. So the question is, wouldn't the market over time change the way those people thought? The challenge we face is the market is rigged to encourage them to succeed. So we don't have a free market. I mean, you know, as a toilet paper salesman, which I proudly was for 25 years, the government of the United States provides a billion dollar subsidy to the virgin fiber industry, artificially making recycled fiber more expensive. So there's no opportunity for the market to, to, to send those signals because the market's getting the opposite signal, that cheaper to buy virgin fiber, why should I spend more money on recycling? Yes?
to 50. It was the least uh, crop diverse state, just point of information. And thank you for what's been a soapbox of mine for 25 years of women on corporate boards. <laughs> Having served on public and private boards, and I truly respect you, but I want to ask you a hard question. I knew you would. That's why I called on you. <laughs> I've been on the Interface Board, the carpet company, for the last 17 years, and I think we do a lot of good things. I'm not doing a commercial, but I do think, and I think it was your experience at Seventh Generation. There's a cadre of companies that sort of started from the 70s and the 80s, or we'll just say roughly, the hippie folks who still wanted to be in business, who you know, created the quote alternative companies. And then other folks went into the quote mainstream companies. And there doesn't seem to be, and I wonder if you're suggesting by cooperatives, there doesn't seem to be a continuum that gets the green ethical companies to the size of what Paul is trying to do at Unilever. And do you think that can happen? Because there's a lot of litter of founders and other people along the way who have run up against the, the, the almost existential jump yep. or chasm that comes. And I, I hope you feel comfortable enough to speak to that, because I think that's a huge challenge and problem for us. Yep. So, so the question is, you know, how do you get these very large companies to follow in the footsteps of the Unilevers and the Kingfishers? And, or get our company bigger? I mean, the truth is, 99 out of 100 of the companies that were peers of mine when I started have been bought by large public companies. So, you know, when you walk into not your natural food store, but most natural food stores, most of the brands that are on the shelf are owned by Kraft and General Mills and, and other companies. Still right. Farm. Organic Valley, that's, yeah. you know. Do we assume that's a bad thing? That's my question. <laughs> well, okay, so this is a complicated conversation. What, one of the things that I know is a bad thing when little companies get consumed by big companies is the level of innovation and risk-taking declines. Now, the theory was that the little companies would infuse the big companies with their values and their mission. Hasn't happened so much. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think that the biggest motivator of large companies changing will be that those responsible companies like Unilever end up doing better than their peers, and they'll be imitated. But, but it's not going to happen quickly enough to deal with most of the challenges that we face. I mean, I, I am somewhat cynical that until we see, on a much larger scale, the negative unintended consequences that these large companies bring on to society, we won't see enough change. I'm sorry to say. And I'm happy to talk with you more. Yeah. Where, where is my microphone now? You got the microphone. So who's asking the question? Um, okay. Um, I have a comment about the Unilever because I know that they were voting against the um, GMO labeling in California, so I'm just worried about um, labeling them as some like better company. I'm wondering why that they did that. And, and when I talk about Unilever, I'm not saying they're getting getting it all right. Right. They're they're moving more in the right direction quicker than most companies their size. Okay. I mean, when you talk to Unilever, one of the things that's nice about them is that they will say that they're still doing most of it wrong. Okay. You know, they've got 400 brands that they've got to manage. And most of those brands are a disaster from a social and environmental perspective. So it's not going to change overnight. <coughs> and I'm not telling you to go buy, I don't believe it's butter, because you believe we're so great. <laughs> you know, some of, the, some of those products need to go away. Yeah, but they own, they own Ben and & Jerry's and stuff like that. So it sounds and that's like a difficult decision. 
when it comes to, to Ben and Jerry's. Most people don't know that Unilever owns Ben and Jerry's. Yeah, yeah. Who's next? Yes. Ben. Yes, I'm a public interest attorney, and I commend uh, you know your uh, your interest and your desire uh, in getting state labeling laws for genetically engineered foods passed. That would be much better than what we have. But it's very important to understand that we don't need any new federal level legislation to properly regulate genetically engineered foods. The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, especially the Food Additive Amendment of 1958, currently requires that all new foods, such as the GE foods, be proven safe before on the market. They're on the market. The problem is, the FDA has broken the law, and they could wink everybody into thinking that somehow their hands were tied by a lack of laws. Actually, their hands were tied by an edict of the Reagan administration that they shouldn't do anything. But that's been continued by every successive administration, including Clinton Gore, including the current one. The problem is, or the solution would be quite easy. Get the federal, get Obama to tell the FDA to follow the law. All these things are on the table. I'm writing a book about it that fully documents and proves what I'm saying, among many other things. Jane Goodall's writing the foreword. I hope you'll read it, and I hope you and others who have entree yeah. to President Obama will get him to read the book, because if he does, that's the solution. Thank you. Thank you. We, we, we have another meeting with everyone at the White House in September, October, so we'll have a chance to bring that up. I would like to talk with you briefly after the okay. thing, just so I can yeah. tell you a little more about yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Who's next? I have a question. Paddle time? It's paddle time? Oh, not paddle. Okay. All right, well, I got one last question. One last question. How many women do you have on your board? Our board, well, we only have a board of four right now, so it's two women and two men. Mm -hmm. 50%, that's pretty good. What? 50%, that's pretty good. Yeah. Should, should be higher. <laughs> <laughs> then they'd have to get rid of me. So. Who should speak? You know, um, you know, we have so many companies in Fairfield 
you know, and Jeffrey yesterday visited some of them, and, you know, to see the good that's coming out of Fairfield, but it's all over the state. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to acknowledge one of them specifically, it's the person I worked with, and I'm just shocked by what he's done. I mean, Steve Greenlee is sitting here in the middle. Steve, just stand up for a second. Please. Steve, wake up. Because this affects ever, all of us. It's something we've been whining about. And it's something that we have, and Steve and his team has brought to us. You know, we're all been concerned about the health care issue and Obamacare. And we hear about the things where it's all bad and there's no opportunity for people. And it's, you know, we're all gonna, our premiums are all going to go up. Well, within Obamacare was the whole idea of the exchanges and the idea that each state could set up their own co-ops. And Steve and his business partners and associates, um, Steve's a very successful business person, are launching on October 1st, Co-Opportunity. Co-Opportunity, which is a co-op, you know, where we take the, the, the middleman out. We take the, the healthcare companies out. It's a new kind of health insurance company designed for the new world, created by the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And we're real lucky to have them do this. That, you know, Iowa, it's part for Iowa and Nebraska, but, you know, Iowa and Nebraska, our, our whole state has, you know, historically had lots of co-ops. You know, we've farmer co-ops. It's cooperative, like Jeffrey was talking about in Spain, in Italy. So this is a healthcare co-op that will be owned by the patient. Yes. And with more options. So I just wanted to, uh, and I don't know all the details, we're going to be putting it up on our website so you can learn more about it. And we want you to know that that's it. It's not just for individuals, it's for businesses small and large to give people more options for their, you know, for their health care and also more options for how much they pay. Could you bring those tables closer to the table? Yes. 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 So I want to get to the panels now. Um, we selected these three people because they're doing really cool things. I mean, the, you know, the, Two of them are community oriented, and the other is corporate oriented. So we're going to start with Adam, Adam Haynes. Now, some of you may know Adam. He's a graduate of MUM, and you know Adam is a, a manager of sustainability. For, believe it or not, for Come and Go. Anyway, they have 440 locations in the Midwest, and Adam champions efforts on lead certified construction within Come and Go. Now imagine that, taking a company that's built these little tiny convenience stores and turning them in to sustainable, green, phenomenal buildings that are saving energy and healthier for everyone. Um, Adam has been involved for seven years in international experience, environmental education, and leadership training in six countries and four continents. And he's, he's just truly amazing. So we wanted him to speak to really show what it's like to instigate, you know, change like this in a large company, like, you know, like Jeffrey was talking about. So first, out of full transparency and out of respect for everything that Jeff had to say, we'll start with what we don't do. And, um, <laughs> and we are definitely aware, and the conversation is alive and well in Come and Go, that we are a convenience store. No one's confused about that. And if you didn't know, Come and Go is a convenience store. Um, we have 440 stores in 11 states. All of them sell petroleum. Um, I've been there for three years and that hasn't changed. Um, we also sell some ethanol blends in, those, uh, in that. Now I will say that we pilot electric vehicle charging stations and we will soon have compressed natural gas. But I would... but those are a very small percentage of what we do. So in, in light of the big picture, um, I didn't go to come and go thinking that it was an existential leap. Um, it wasn't a new company starting from scratch being, uh, being sustainable from the ground up. It was a, it's a family run, privately held company, so there's a lot of different aspects of that um, and that we're very proud of. But it's also, we don't share all the wealth. You know, it is a family that has run it for the last three generations. Um, but I knew that when I signed up. So I think that there's a all, all of the above strategy. We need the ex existential companies that start that way from the beginning and lead that beacon. And we have 99% of the other companies that have to figure out a way to start from where they are and take them down that road and not wait till the, you know their kids convince them. Um, so that's hopefully what I'm doing for a living. So I wanted to be very transparent and say that that's what I do for a living. 
And then I'll tell you a quick story, and then I'll hand it off because I only want to take a few minutes and have mostly questions. So I grew up in Richland, Iowa. It's 12 miles north of Fairfield. I'm a farm kid from Iowa. Um, MBA from Fairfield at the MUM in 2006, and then I moved back to Iowa. Um, I went to California and I came back to Des Moines in 2008. Um, my roommate was the architect for Come and Go, and she told me, Hey, I just designed these two lead certified stores for Come and Go. And I was like, Are you kidding me? I'm like, Take me, let me see them. Um, so when I went to Des Moines for the first time, I figured out here's a convenience store that I'd never heard of was doing lead certified stores. So I already decided to shop at Come and Go, but then I sold my car and I don't own a car, so I don't buy gas. I still very much support people who do choosing this. Um, one of the things that I did when I came on, I got hired in 2010. We had already built those two stores and we created an institutionalized system, which is the lead volume program, the first and only convenience store that's in lead volume. So we've committed to building all of our stores to uh, lead certification. And, and, and that's just in the construction side. We have um, obviously, we have 69 projects today, and that's more than the closest convenience store. They have, I think, 38 um, in, this, in the United States. And we turn around and do best practices and retrofit. Okay, look, our old stores, how do we take our best practices and build a model that we can retrofit and bring our older stores? Because obviously we have 300 and some stores that are not lead certified. So from a systems standpoint, you have to have a strategy. You can't just have a new building strategy. You have to have a company-wide strategy. One of the other things is that we're actively um, piloting at the pump recycling for our customers because if we don't provide it, um, I'm, a, I'm a convenience person. I'm in a hurry. They average three and a half minutes at our store. They will just throw it in the trash. You know, we have to have a bin at every recycle, a recycling bin at every trash can, and we hope to expand that even this year in two more major cities. Uh, water savings is something that we focus on. Our stores save 20% water. We have all low flow fixtures. I irrigation control is something that's very important, um, and motion sensor faucets. This is our first solar project in Newcastle, Colorado. Um, not in itself is it spectacular, but we're very proud of it. We're evaluating um, the production level. But if you could see more of this, this is a marketing photo. It's very beautiful. But there's two-thirds of that camp canopy that we found couldn't hold solar panels because it was an extension of the existing canopy. So as of last year, 2012, we did a specification change. All of our new stores and new canopies are engineered to hold and plug and play, have the electrical and everything run so that they can have solar ready canopies for the future. <laughs> from, a, from a social standpoint, we were founded in 1959. Like I said, we're a privately held family company, but Bill Krauss, our founder, one of the founders actually passed away, you might have seen it in the paper just two days ago. Uh, and he was very much known for giving back to people. 10% of our profits has been given back every year since the 50s. And so we're very proud of that. We don't market it very well, but it's not for the marketing. But we like to let people know that that is something we're very proud of and that we do. <laughs> Safety, um, you could say that that's the number one most important thing that we have to do as a company. Um, if, you, if you look at our safety record, it's very strong, but we are in the industry that that's the number one hot button issue that we'll always have is we still retail fuel. Um, 12 years before it was mandated, in 1993, we actually switched to what's called fiberglass double wall tanks. They're monitored 24 seven by an emergency response team. So we take it very seriously and we're always trying to get better. Our fuel hauling um, partner has won a safety award every year since 1996. And that's the one area that we have to be the best but continue to get better. Because until we, as a society, can shift away from fossil fuels, we have to do the best job we can from a safety standpoint. This is something you may recognize, it's in Fairfield. I'm really happy to see the grass is growing. <laughs> and we actually worked with Scott on this project and the USDA and the DNR and said, you know, from a stormwater management project, we need to do the best we could on our site. And uh, we were a little worried. We, sometimes the installation is difficult to maintain, but this one looks like it's been very well. There's another one in the back of the store that's bigger than this. Um, but we're trying with all of our municipalities, we have what's called a, manual, a best practices manual. Um, a lot of the times we're told what we can and can't do by the municipality, but we have a whole pilot concept of 
here's what we'd like to try. Um, if you'll let us, let us do this. A lot of people think that looks like weeds. So we're, there's a lot of education that has to happen in 11 different states. Luckily, Fairfield is one of the most progressive cities that we've worked in. Um, and as you said, you know, do whatever you want. We have a stormwater issue, we really want to tackle it. Um, I don't want to take up questions right now, so I won't leave that slide up. But um, some of the things that we do on a cultural standpoint, I would say that I'm very proud. Things that I learned as my MBA um, kind of courses you know, went through and educated me as we do 360 degree uh, evaluations every year for our leadership team so that they hear from not only the people above them paying their checks, but people below them, people to the side, partners in different business areas. Um, we do a best places to work survey every year, very transparent. We send it out to everyone with our top three and our bottom three issues. And we have an action plan of what we're gonna do to make those bottom three issues better next year. Um, we give benefits to all of our associates, even part-time. So we offer a wider range of benefits to associates and that's important for us. There's always things that we can do better. Um, but I, like I said, our sustainability from an environmental standpoint is in its infancy. Our social responsibility has been fairly progressive for a young company in the Midwest, but we, we know where we are and who we are. And we're one of those groups that's trying to take the old paradigm and continue to make it better and move towards one of those existential leaders like a seventh generation or a unique group. Iowa City's environmental coordinator in 2009 after serving as the city's naturalist. Her job focuses on environmental issues facing the city with tasks ranging from coordinating energy audits of the city's buildings, calculating community-wide and city government greenhouse gas emissions. She just completed Iowa City's sustainability assessment which measures 60 sustainable indicators. It will provide a baseline for future development. So, Brenda. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. It's a real pleasure to be in Fairfield and be with this uh, awesome panel. So um, I'm happy to speak, and uh, I feel like everybody's starting with full disclosure. And I feel like somebody said, you know, everybody's anti-government. I should say, I'm Brenda, I'm government or something. <laughs> so, um, but what I'm here to tell you about is some of the good things that government is doing, especially a lot of cities, city governments are doing um, a lot of a lot of work in sustainability and. Um, after me, you hear from Tim, and I'm sure you, are, you know what Fairfield, what, what Fairfield is doing, and, and Tim will talk about uh, that. But what really struck me at, after listening um, to Jeffrey and also Adam is how much um, th their principles are the same for a city government, and some of the things that they say um, apply to city government as well. And even though we're not a business, it's really important for a city to be sustainable as well, because Iowa City think, if I'm correct, is about 137 years old, and we plan on on maintaining our, our city for as many years as possible. So uh, for a city, you know, cities don't really come and go like, uh, <laughs> uh, I guess they do lose population though, and Iowa City is one of the uh, cities that is gaining population, so we plan to be around for a long time and want to do the best practices that we can uh, to make good planning and good um, good uh, approach. So what I'm going to talk to you today is um, about is our new sustainability assessment that's on our city website. And I'm just going to go through really fast some of the highlights of what we've been doing and then pass it over to Tim. And I mean really fast. So um, this is, uh, what we did was we decided we don't have a sustainability plan like Fairfield does. Um, but we decided to do a sustainability assessment and kind of do measurements on different sustainability indicators and see where we were with, before we decided where we're going to go. And I'm going to click through these slides and not going to turn around with my necks because I wouldn't want to look at you guys and say, so if I'm off, let me know, okay? So everybody uh, has heard about the three uh, circles of sustainability. And so Iowa City had been doing a lot of things uh, that were really sustainable projects, but kind of in diverse departments and everything, and didn't have a whole 
uh, umbrella that, that we didn't use the word sustainability. So um, now putting all this together in the sustainability assessment, we're trying to look at things in more a, a whole systems approach like everybody else has talked about. So um, we decided to look at 60 different indicators over a five year period. Um, and see what trends, and see, try to measure our city in numbers and see how sustainable we were you know, in, in all different areas. So what makes this a little bit different is, as you know, Iowa City is a college town, and what makes one of the real things that's different about our assessment and our city is that um, we have 41% of people that are, are really uh, younger than most uh, American cities so because of the college students, so that really changes our a profile quite a bit and change it how, the way that we um, have to measure things. Uh, we have much higher than average high school graduation rates and we have a very highly educated population. So uh, some, of the, some of the different indicators we had to really look at because of our uh, profiles is different than a lot of just um, cities that don't have a large college po population. So um, for our indicators report, we looked at nine focus areas in the three main um, categories of sustainability, and they're listed here. Um, I'm not going to go through them; just highlight some of the. I'm going to highlight some of the things that we um, celebrate. First of all, one of the things um, that we looked at is transportation, and we found out that actually Iowa City is about half of the vehicle miles traveled per capita. And that again probably comes because of the high student population. We also have good uh, bus transportation and uh, a lot of people ride their bikes. Uh, we also looked at our greenhouse gas, um, continue looking at this every year. And while we're not meeting the 25% reduction um, that is suggested by the red line, we're not, um, we're also not going, meeting the, uh, business as usual projection of our population growth. So we're kind of hanging and um, the people that are really doing the most are the city government and the University of Iowa. Uh, so we are making um, we are making some progress in that area, even though those numbers might show that and Scott's really gonna show me up. But um, we're, we, um, we, do we are building lead buildings. This is our new Eastside Recycling Center. Um, that has solar, it has, uh, you can see our, our small wind turbine, and also we have geothermal. Um, this, we built this, it has a lot of best practices to, we're hoping to lead by example. We have five or six different um, stormwater management systems. We have a third acre of bio, bio cells, we have rain gardens, and they are, they are uh, really something to maintain. We have about 68 uh, species of uh, native plants in our bio cells, and um, they really do a good job uh, taking the stormwater off the site. So um, we have we have other we have stormwater examples, energy. Uh, we have a green roof you can see and a green wall. And if you're ever in Iowa City, I encourage you to stop by. We have a lot of outdoor education signs um, that tell you about the different uh, things there. One thing that we have been working on with federal funding is our municipal energy usage and we have dropped our municipal usage by about 17% over the last two or three years, which is pretty amazing. So that is, we do have control over that and uh, we've done that mostly with our water and our wastewater plant. Um, unlike Fairfield, our main energy provider is MidAmerican and MidAmerican's the number one lead in, in wind energy and uh, they have gone up over the last five years in renewable energy, and so they now have about 33% renewable energy uh, for electricity. So our electricity, a lot of that in Iowa City comes from renewable sources. The city... Um, I, I wish that I could say the city also had, that, uh, that the city had a lot of um, renewable energy um, but we're working on that. Uh, we started with our east side recycling and it would be really nice if we got some more solar and some other things with the, and greened our portfolio. Um, this is an example of one of our prairies. We have um, over 800 acres of natural areas that are in native uh, prairie, uh, wetlands, and forest areas and we have planted and reconstructed a lot of those which I think is really um, a wonderful thing. Um, 
But uh, as one, one of our wonderful things and one of our banes is the Iowa River. And as you probably have, might have heard, Iowa River's on the impaired waters list. And so it's a beautiful, re it's a beautiful thing. That's the reason that Iowa City was founded there. But uh, we also have big problems with flooding. And that really affects our city government and um, our town. You can see in 2008 it was flooded, but when it's uh, when it's not flooding, it's a, it can be a wonderful amenity. But that is uh, one of, one of our issues is flooding, and so we've really worked on uh, floodplain management, and um, we're always going to have to be dealing with the river since we have higher uh, precipitation events, and we've had uh, three 100-year floods in like 15 years or something. So. Um, Another thing that we're doing is we have three streams within Iowa City and we're working on assessing those and making sure that those uh, don't erode and contribute to flooding and so we're uh, working with the university on that. We're also doing stream sampling. Oops. Thank you. Thanks for uh, We are also doing stream sampling and um, looking at our own streams and the water quality so that we have control over what happens within the city limits in our watershed. Uh, but up, up the watershed, we have a lot of agriculture, so we don't have control over that. Um, another, another place we shine is that we, uh, Johnson County is the uh, lowest county as far as obesity, and that, again, I would have to contribute to the uh, college students remember all those young people. Um, we also have a great farmer's market that's won a lot of awards and has been going on for um, 40 years. So a lot of people buy fresh fruits and vegetables and it's very popular. Um, I'm not sort of separating these into environmental and, and uh, economic and social, but I think you can tell I've gone into the social part. We're also a UNESCO city of literature. We're the second one in the in the world and we're very proud of that in our culture and our arts and our writer's workshop. and. And uh, many of, we're, we're a very good place to live socially. We have a lot of events and um, a very uh, close, neighborly, nice population, I would say. Um, one of the issues we do have is we have a, a radon um, issue. And most places in Iowa, uh, because of our glacial soils, do can have high radon things. So this is something that we might look more into in getting some grants. and and looking into, because 37%, I don't know if you could see, of the houses in Johnson County have uh, higher than should be radon, and, and that's from the uh, basements and the, and the rocks and the radioactive gas that comes through the basement. But uh, this is an example of, you know, we're not the only ones, I was just one of many states. And the bottom picture is uh, my neighbor's house to show you that you can mitigate for that and get it out get it out of your house, um, but you have to test, you have to buy a $4 test kit at the hardware store. And this looks like uh, Fairfield, but Iowa City has a, today, doesn't it? It's, but this is Iowa City. And we do have a rich, um, a rich cultural scene with a lot of festivals and a lot of uh, arts and culture and music, and I think that's one of the things that makes it a great place. But we also, uh, we've talked about social equity. Um, we also have a lot of services for the homeless, for the poor, for people in time of need. So um, we do think a lot about social um, justice as well. So um, the, after doing this report, it's about a 100-page report looking at these 60 different indicators. Um, we do rank really high in sustainability. We haven't really measured it before, really thought of it in, the, in that way, but it really is kind of neat to think of it in a whole system as a city. And we didn't just look at the city operations, we looked at the whole community. And so now we have a bench, benchmark numbers that we can mark um, where we need to improve and where we should go from here. And so we found several focus areas, you know, as I mentioned, the radon, also our water quality. Um, from our rivers and streams, and uh, hopefully this will um, benchmark and launch us on to the next stage in making a sustainability plan, and we can prove on the areas um, that we need to and keep continuing on the areas that we're doing good. So, and I think there's a lot of that. So, thank you. I cannot figure out how to turn that one on. So, um, uh, I want to thank all of you for staying and listening. There's so much you know, about what we're doing. So now I want to introduce Scott Tim. Many of you know Scott. And, um, Scott is our sustainability coordinator here in Fairfield. 
Um, he has a co collaboration between Fairfield and Iowa State, uh, it's extension and outreach, and you know, so many of the things that you know our town and its uh, you know its green plan that Ed has wanted to do. Scott is the one making it happen, uh, rather than me. This long introduction, he's the guy in Fairfield that's bringing these results. So I'd like to introduce him, and he can uh, show you what we're doing. So I'm going to uh, really focus on the Hometown Awards program. We're talking about celebrating results. Uh, I'm very thankful to be working with the city of Fairfield. I really enjoy my job. And uh, there's so many things that are going on in the city of Fairfield within the departments, department heads. Uh, but I'm going to just focus on the Hometown Awards program, uh, which we've been working on here now for the last two years. And we have some really amazing results uh, to share. So, but to talk for a second, I'll back up to put it in context. Maybe, uh, many of you probably know about the Go Green plan. This is a strategic plan that the city has created that really focuses on um, a long list of ways that we can be a more sustainable community. And I feel very lucky to be involved in, in helping move that forward. So we have three main goals to that plan. Uh, first is to create and maintain a sustainability culture. The second goal is to create jobs, wealth, and opportunities for investment with sustainable development. And the third is to achieve sustainable community design, public policy, and infrastructure. This plan was designed by a group of people that really came from all different parts of the community. And that is one of the things that has made it so successful, is that it's really working as hard as possible to include the entire community. There are 40 objectives to that plan. These are the categories. And really in the first, I'd say, year and a half, we were very much focused on leadership, education, and outreach. Really that creating the <clears throat> culture of sustainability. And uh, then we came across this opportunity with Alliant Energy to look at our energy use and create something that would help us all to lower citywide uh, our energy use. So um, backtracking, we were looking before in the education and outreach parts we were doing workshops on weatherization. Uh, we were pulling together all the amazing groups, conservation groups like the Sierra Club and all these wonderful folks to run workshops we call backyard conservation. So backyard beekeeping for beginners and uh, chickens and you know, gardening, just a really wide range of amazing topics. And so we've always been trying to tap this amazing local talent we have for all those workshops. And a lot of what we've been doing has also been kind of projecting everything coming from the library, which has been a really amazing resource for us as well. So we had the opportunity, working with Alliant, to create something called the Hometown Awards Program. And so very briefly, uh, Alliant Energy spends a lot of money on energy efficiency. And they came up with this idea, which was, if we were to give a community funding and said, you create what that program would look like, would that be more effective? And I don't think they quite knew what they got themselves into when they chose Fairfield <laughs> to create their own program. And, uh, but we really, in the same way that we created the Go Green Plan, we brought a large group of people together from all walks of the uh, community to design a program that was very much Fairfield. 37 strategies, 10 goals, uh, we're measuring 10 different metrics. Uh, an outside group is actually measuring all of our progress. So. Um, the idea was we really wanted to use that local talent, we wanted to highlight local experts, and we wanted to use people in our community as examples of what's happening. You may also know uh, my partner in crime, Anna Bruin. Uh, you, if you open your mailbox, the last couple of times, amazing. Yep. And, uh, she couldn't be here today. She is very much uh, behind the success of, of the execution of this program. And uh, you may see her picture in the mail. We've had ads like that running all the time, we took a bend on the hometown rewards and we focused on what's your reward. And we picked companies and businesses and people in the community and said, what would be your reward for saving 15% in your energy bills? What would that mean for you? For my family, it was uh, more quality time that we could afford a rec center pass and we could spend more time swimming and hanging out. Uh, for Anna, it was able, uh, the ability to spend more time in our garden and buy you know, beautiful plants and things. And, hy V it was um, seriously reducing their greenhouse gases, leading by example. Agroindustrial plastics was being more competitive. They've saved incredible amounts of money with their lighting retrofits. So um, we kind of divide our program into three parts. One is energy. Obviously, uh, that's something we're focusing on. On the left, uh, along with the education, 
we wanted there to be a fund, so we leveraged that money to get a $1 million grant um, that's a revolving loan fund, which leverages another $3 million, so a total of $4 million available for energy products uh, projects in Fairfield. That's all through our local banks. Um, we, uh, it's called the Jefferson County Energy Rewards Program. You can go to any of your local banks and, and access information like that. Education has been really amazing too. Uh, we've been working with all the schools, public and private schools in town. Uh, we've been holding workshops monthly at the library, do-it-yourself, solar hot water, geothermal, solar. Uh, all these different workshops trying to show people what the options are uh, to save and reduce your electrical use, but also providing funding options, rebate options, trying to really help scaffold that so that everybody can see, uh, here's what I could do, and here are the ways that I can get it done. Um, civic engagement, this has been really fun. You may have remembered, uh, you may remember the Dig In Fairfield event that we did last year. I've got some of these in the back. Uh, we planted a public orchard uh, next to Chautauqua Park, which is amazing. If you are by Chautauqua Park, take a walk. There's peaches now growing there. It's really, everything's doing beautifully. So, and a lot of people in this room have given a lot of time and energy to that pro uh, project and others. But um, we planted trees for energy efficiency around the community. We worked with all the schools and um, we got a lot of people involved in a lot of these projects, especially looking at some of the weatherization stuff that we've done. And so uh, we have now in Fairfield, we do these weatherization blitzes every year. We have over 200 people trained in basic weatherization techniques and we go out in one day and we'll weatherize 15 homes. Uh, last year we received a grant from the Home Depot Foundation to weatherize veterans homes. So that was our goal uh, on our project last fall, was to work with veterans. And uh, we're seeing just really spectacular results. So I'm really shortening everything that we've been up to, but uh, we've had 13 workshops so far. We've had two different contractor training workshops. So again, along with the funding arm and the education arm, we're also trying to build local capacity to make that happen. Um, we have been working with almost 350 students and the elementary school has created, a, Pence approached us to create a little mini audit team. And so they've got a group of uh, 12 or 15 students who walk around and remind people to turn off lights and turn off projectors. And it's been really, they have tickets that they give out. It's pretty cool. And, uh, they actually doubled their goal. Their goal was to reduce their energy use by uh, 1,200 kilowatt hours and they doubled it and uh, their reward was planting 25 trees at Pence for energy efficiency and shade, and they also had a big pizza party. So we had a lot of fun working with them. Um, civic engagement results, we've had, uh, now I think, I, don't, I think we're up to over 400 workshop attendees with our last couple of workshops. We've had 232 of these pledges. We did research into what's really effective, and so having people really stop and pause and think and make a pledge to reduce their energy use in different ways, is a really a great way to get people to actually reduce their energies. These are up on the shelf back there, and so I'd like if you haven't filled one of these out to grab one on your way out and fill it out, and you can stick it right in the mail. It's postage paid. Um, we had almost a thousand people at our kickoff event last year. We have had over 1,800 volunteer hours so far. Uh, we've planted 360 trees. This one is amazing to me. We've almost reached our goal of 50% of the town participating in the program. So that, I think, is absolutely astounding. We're within like 300 people of making that goal of 50%. <laughs> um, it's, to me, pretty amazing that we took a $70,000 grant from Alliant and leveraged it to over $4 million in uh, local economic activity. Pretty amazing uh, piece of leverage there. But this is probably the biggest result. Uh, when we started, we said, what should be our goal? And uh, in the beginning, we were talking, let's do 6%. And they were saying, no way are you going to make 6%. Communities can never do that. It's not possible. As of December, so we're not even counting this spring, we're at over 8.5% total energy use reduction for the community. And that's whether we're going to So, so <laughs> to put that in perspective, so we doubled our goal. And to put that in perspective, that's 10 million. 200,000 kilowatt hours as of December that we've saved. That's over a million dollars in energy savings that stayed in the community. And this morning I went onto the EPA website to figure out the carbon equivalent. That's like saving 806,000 gallons of gas uh, or the electricity use 
for a year of 1,077 homes that we've done in just over a year. So from an economic standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, it's just pretty amazing the results we've got so far. Uh, they've seen a 263% increase in rebates that have been turned in through a line. And so that's a, another piece that we're really doing, is trying to help people realize there are a lot of incentives out there to lower your energy use, and people just don't know about it. And so it's been a big focus of ours too. So what's next? Uh, we're currently building a Habitat for Humanity home. We're using it as an example of energy efficiency and thriftiness. And we're looking at doing a solar hot water installation, Alliance Powerhouse TV is filming it. And we're doing a lot of great work. We're always looking for volunteers. We build on every Tuesday and Saturday and we would love to have you sign up and help. So ways that you can get involved, again, you can grab one of these on your way out, and you can also find us on Facebook, find me, and help us out with Habitat for Humanity Home. It's a great project. And uh, we are doing a big celebration September 14th at the library. We're gonna have a bike in movie, and we're going to have live music and food, and our reward from Alliant for reaching our goals is that they're going to help us put solar panels on the library. So we're doing where people can see what the energy use is of the library and how much that's saving, but also have all the information around energy that's available uh, in a kiosk that's going to be dedicated on that same day. So that will be a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks to Anne Hoffer. Anne and Scott are quite a team here in Fairfield. So I, uh, this has gone much longer than we thought. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions. Uh, I, I think that we, why don't we just uh, end? I, actually, we have a few things we want to tell you first. And uh, it's been so exciting to launch ISBA and have all these wonderful panelists and you know, hear these successes and have Jeffrey here. I just want to tell you one goal we have in ISBA, and then I'd like to just introduce uh, our, our chairman to quickly close. Um, in ISBA, when we started this whole thing in Washington and saw the power of numbers, and we came back, Troy Van Beek and my daughter Laura and I and a few other of our board members, we were sitting together and saying, what could be the best thing we could do? And it came out, have numbers. And we discovered there's almost 250,000 small businesses in Iowa that's under 500 employees. And of those, the vast majority have under 10 employees. And the more we learned about this, the more we saw that what we had to offer was to, as Jeffrey says, level the playing field, give power to these companies. So we set the goal of a tipping point, and tipping point practices, you know, 10%. So we set the goal, outrageous as it is, to get 25,000 small businesses, or any size business, to be a member of ISBA. And we plan to do this as quickly as we can. And last night at our reception, Kurt Hansen was there, and afterwards, during it, I came up to him, I said, Kurt, what would it feel like if we walked into your office and had 25,000 members? And he looked at it, afterwards, he came up to me and says, Paul, you could get anything you want. <laughs> I mean, 25,000 is a lot, so that's what we set out to do. And what it means is getting everybody's help. You know, we have our brochures. We've set our membership fees. You don't even have to become a member. You can donate some money. It's very low. And starting in a few weeks, we're going to have a statewide membership campaign. And then we're also adding all the education and advocacy and policy um, elements to it. And we're going to go forward in Des Moines and start representing us, whether it's GMO issues or B Corp status for Iowa, you know, to, to do whatever we can do. And that's going to be based upon what our members want. So we invite, we're just you, we're, that's all we are, just a bunch of people who never set out to do this. Yet everybody in this room shares the same values and commitments. So we want to invite all of you to contribute to us, if, whatever amount of time you have, little time, a lot of time, just help us and tell us what you want. And we're going to go out you know, to every university in the state, every community. Um, today we got our first member business from Des Moines to join, which is great. So. Um, I'd like to introduce, just um, in closing, John Matthews. Where is John? Oh, John has a mic. John is our chairman. I just want to tell you a quick story. When we came, I know I've been talking too much. When we came back from Washington, we had no idea how we were going to pull this off. 
And I talked about the planets being aligned. Everything has been supported by nature for us. And the best part was Troy and myself are starting businesses. We have very little time. And we wondered who was going to do this. And we met John. John has started many nonprofits. Many of you may not know this, the, the um, organic food um, standards that were set up in the early 90s. John was part of that. And he moved here to Fairfield recently, and I just met him, and he listened to what we were doing, and he said, who's going to do this? And I said, I have no idea. No idea. And he says, I'll do it. <laughs> so he is a... Uh, you know, there's a lot of legal, organizational, motivational... So John is a hero to us, and we're lucky to have him. And he just wants to close um, and, and tell you a few things. So thank Thanks very much. Well, I, I, I think uh, what I'd like to say is I'd like to bring the spotlight back to ISBA as we leave and tell you a little bit about what we're actually going to be doing and why this is important to you and what you might do to help. Uh, we have a real simple, what we're thinking of as a three-by-three three business plan. We have three things we want to accomplish and three methods to do it. And the things we want to accomplish is we want to create a home for sustainable businesses, a place where sustainable businesses can feel that their needs are being met and that they have a voice and uh, representation on issues important to sustainable business. Second thing is, is we want to provide a pathway to sustainability for businesses who have not embraced these things yet. We want businesses who uh, are interested in or curious about sustainable practices, but within their own support structures aren't going to get a lot of help to do those things, to come to us and we can find ways for them to move forward on that. So we have an open door policy. Third thing is, is we want to define the role, uh, uh, of, the role of everyone in sustainable business. We want to have uh, an organization that includes not just businesses, but everyone. Uh, educational organizations, nonprofits, consumers, uh, individuals, students, and we have a, a due structure that creates a, an entry point for everyone, no matter what your role is, in the support of sustainable businesses. We also want to produce or, or provide opportunities for involvement directly in ways that uh, allow everyone to have some role in moving forward on uh, the, you know, the role of sustainability in business. Um, so those are the three things we want to accomplish. Our three methods are pretty typical sort of association methods, although we're not an association. And they are public education. Uh, if you look at you know, what uh, was so wonderful about what Jeffrey did in his talk today, it's just classic public education. He did two things. He brought you information you didn't have about the world around you that is important for you to know that you did not know yet. Second thing is he inspired you by giving you a vision of possibilities. Those are the two ways that we will pursue public education for everyone about sustainable business. The second thing we want to do, the second method, is public policy and legislative advocacy. There are so many issues, there are so many ways that the deck is stacked against sustainable approaches. And the only way to cure a lot of that is to go back into the machinery of public policy and make those changes. Now, we have a relationship with ASPC so that an Iowa voice can be involved and included and heard at the national level. We are creating the state level version of that because a lot of what happens uh, to make life either hard or easy for sustainable approaches happens in Des Moines. And so we want to be able to provide the machinery and the mechanisms to address issues at the state level and even at the local and county level. So the third thing that we want to do is uh, sustainable business development in a very direct way, not simply to enable others to do, but for us to do. You know, classic uh, methods of sustainable business development are incubation and acceleration of either emerging or existing businesses, and all sorts of technical assistance and, and support in very direct ways to people's uh, efforts to establish or extend sustainable business practices. So that's kind of our uh, business plan in a nutshell, a simple business plan being a good one. And the, the last thing I want to say to you is that this thing is designed very specifically for direct public involvement. The other thing that's important to know is that our revenue model depends on dues. It, we have to have dues in order to stay alive. So I'm urging all of you to join. We have a dues structure for each of you. And the beauty is, you know, I don't, uh, you know, we have the uh, 
the very good luck to have Laura Tarnoff, who's been serving as our coordinator and doing a wonderful job. If everyone who attended this, thing, this presentation today were to go on our website when you got home and joined up at the appropriate dues level, which is very, very uh, 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 low, uh, we could afford to keep Laura on for a year just on that. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be a huge break of effort. So I want to encourage each of you to go onto the website. It's isballiance.org. And look at the website, you'll see the opportunities for involvement, and we're developing new ones every day. You'll see the opportunity to join and pay dues and help us stay alive. And I'm just, I'm pleading with you to do that. It makes a huge difference to us. And so having said all that, thank you ever so much for coming and, and listening today. It's been a great, great presentation by Jeffrey and the panelists. And uh, this is not the last you'll see of us. Thank you. Thank you.